Hey, our church, how's it going? Kyle here. I just want to say a special thank you to everyone who helped deliver those Thanksgiving meals this weekend. We blessed our community so much. There's so much thankfulness flowing from those families, but I just want to welcome you to our online experience that's about to start right now. Pastor Dean has a great word. Tune in. Let's get it going. Good morning. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 9. We're in, uh, my name's Dean, by the way, if you're a guest, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, thank you to everybody who delivered a meal or paid for those meals. It went almost flawlessly. When I say almost, one family delivered a meal and the dude answered the door in his underwear. So, it wasn't perfect. We delivered dinner and we got a show. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> It's what I do. So we're in this collection. By the way, it's Melanie's birthday. <laughs> finally 21. Can finally have a glass of wine tonight. We're so glad you're here. We've been in this collection on, on uh, miracles. And... We've been praying every, every weekend for miracles and the stories that, thank you for sending texts and emails about the neat things Jesus has done. Because if Jesus doesn't show up, what in the world are we doing here? Right? Uh, I've had some good experiences with acupuncture. I know not everybody feels that way. But this one acupuncturist who every person in our family has seen he was saying the other day he's like I never advertise because this stuff either works or it doesn't right and if it works everybody they know knows about how well it works right and I kind of when I hear that I'm like yeah me too if Jesus isn't real if he can't heal if he can't forg forgive and restore and renew hope then I'm out but if he's real this is the best time of your week. So today we're talking about, about miracles. And we're just walking through the book of John. There are seven miracles in the book of John. Today I want to talk about this, this miracle that happens to Jesus, uh, really through Jesus, to this guy who had been blind. And it's kind of a weird process because Jesus spits in the dirt, makes a mud pie, puts it on this guy's eyes. He's never seen in his life, never had vision. And Jesus tells him to wash off this stuff and he, when he does, he could see. So that's a little weird. Uh, but the, right after he gets this healing, the Pharisees, because the healing was done on a Sabbath, which was illegal in that, in that country at that time, uh, they tried to prosecute Jesus by grilling the guy who had been healed. 
And so it's just kind of an interesting story that the miracle, this, nobody even cared who this guy was before, but as soon as he got healed by Jesus, the miracle actually created more problems for him. And some of you know about that. But I want to, I want, when we read the story, I want to pay particular attention, not just to what happened, because everybody's miracle is different. And Jesus did that once with the mud and the spit and the eyes, but he, he, he does it differently for everybody else. So the story itself is not very instructive. Jesus is not going to walk up to you, and if you have really intense acne, he's going to spit in the ground and put mud and put it on. Maybe he might. The dermatologist might. But uh, usually Jesus does a fresh miracle for, for everybody in a different way, right? Can I hear an amen? So what I want to talk about is I want to read the story and highlight all of the not all of them, but several of the changes. Say changes. The changes that have to happen in order for the miracle to take place. Now I want, I want you to catch this because most of the time we miss it. What we do is we look around and we don't like how much money we make. We don't like how our friends are acting. We wish our spouse would change. We have... We, we don't feel good in our health. And so we say, God, leave me alone, but change that. Instead, what you'll see in this miracle and in almost every miracle that you see and read in the scripture is the first thing God changes is us. And then he does a miracle to our circumstances, to our health, to our finances. You are not going to be able to remain the same. Okay? And I kind of wonder if this is why we miss a lot of miracles. Because when it comes time and God starts asking you to do something that you're uncomfortable with. Put the mud on the eyes and wash. And we're just like, hey, if you're not going to fix my eyes, just don't bother. Because you don't, you don't see how what God is putting you through. And so you... Because you reject the change, because it makes you uncomfortable, you ultimately are rejecting the miracle. Are you following me? So every person in here, I learned a long time ago these three truths about change. And I learned it from an oncologist friend. Here are the three truths, and I'll, then I'll tell you how I learned them. Number one, all change is initially perceived as a loss. Write it down because you're going to wonder, why do I feel sad even though something happy just happened? It doesn't matter if what the change is happy or sad. You can have a, a child graduate from high school, which is kind of a great thing, amen? Right. But you're going to also, uh, like the next day, you're going to feel like, oh, it's kind of sad, that's over, that season. You could be in a little house and earn your way into a big house and you move in and you're and you roll over and say to your spouse, weren't we cozy in the old house? You hated the old house. But really, the change, all change, is initially perceived as a loss. And number two, all losses are grieved. You're going to grieve. So when your daughter gets married, you're kind of happy, but then you start to think it's a loss, so you grieve one of the happiest days of your life. Here's the third truth. All of that grief has to be dealt with. If you don't deal with it in a healthy way, you'll deal with it in an unhealthy way. You'll drink too much. You'll kick the dog. You get the idea, right? I learned this from my friend who worked as a psychologist in an oncology office. And she came to see me because I had gone through physical change that was difficult for me. We all go, this is the thing about age is that there's always changes, true? And those changes are almost always bad, true? The other day I was looking at Instagram, this was about a month ago, five weeks, and there was a, for some reason, that's a mystery to me, 
the algorithm decided that I would be interested in hair loss. So it gave me, it gave me an ad about how to make my hair lush again. So I spent $600 <laughs> buying a hair tonic. It's like a shampoo and a conditioner. And then there's this thing I put in every night and do this whole deal. Because when I'm looking back at these messages, I notice I got this bald spot right here. And um, you know what? This is really therapeutic for me. <laughs> I want to thank you all for sitting through the session. <laughs> so anyway, I just, I want at the end, I'm going to look like Fabio. You know what I mean? Just like flowing down. But, but the thing is, right, I've got more coming out of my ears than I do out of the top of my head. So it's a change, but it's not a good change. And I'm insecure about it. You follow? You have stuff like that too. And 25, next week will be 20, almost 25 years since I lost um, the ability to move this side of my face. I, I, had got, I had gotten an ear infection and I didn't go to the doctor and I, it was a busy time. And I had a, if memory serves, it was a Tuesday and I had a funeral at 11 and then I had some stuff that night. So I made it through the funeral, but I was just, I had a temperature and I was so uncomfortable. And so I had about an hour and a half and I thought I'm going to go home and take a nap. So I ran home during the lunch hour and laid down, fell asleep. I woke up and when I woke up, I, I thought, man, I got to get back to work. But then I had a thought, I, I thought, I know it'll help. I'm going to have a piece of cake before, just go with me. Your process may be different than mine. But I cut a piece of cake and I thought, I'm going to have some cake before I go back to work. So I put the fork in the cake and I tried to put the fork in my mouth, which I have done many times before. And I popped myself in the face with this fork and, and it was like ow and I kind of looked at my reflection there and I went to the went to the mirror to see what was going on and I could and my this whole side of my face was paralyzed I drove myself to the hospital I thought I was having a stroke but they said I had Bell's palsy I don't know if you've ever heard of it but I you have a facial nerve that kind of runs through here and by your ear and that ear infection had attached itself to this nerve and killed the nerve. And it took months to get that back. So it's in that, in the middle of that recovery that this gal from the oncology office came to me and she said, how are you doing with your grief? And I said, what grief? I'm not grieving, and I said that because I'm a dude, and we don't think about our feelings, right? Can I hear an amen from the men in here, right? It took her telling me I was in grief, and then I'm like, yeah, I guess I am kind of bummed. I, I know this is gonna sound, this is gonna sound funny, but up until that point, I had considered myself kind of a good-looking fellow, you know what I mean? And now I, now I look like Frankenstein. I can't smile. Even to this day, I'm super self-conscious about the pictures I take because one eye doesn't open as good as the other and my smile is wonky and so I try to, I'm all, every picture for 25 years has been, you know, self-conscious. And this little gal sits down and says, Dean, every change, even the change in your face, is going to be perceived as a loss. Every loss is grieved. Every grief has to be dealt with. Perhaps this is why we resist God doing miracles. If the miracle necessitates us changing. Because we don't know what we're going to be like if we weren't drinking, right? Getting sober, good or bad? Good, but it's a change. 
And every change is going to be perceived as a loss. Every loss is going to be grieved. You kind of miss the person you were, at least occasionally, right? More uninhibited. Is it, is it happy when you get married? Yeah, it's good. Kyle and uh, Jacqueline are going to have a baby, right? And she was, yeah, she was, she was due on Friday, so she's any, any minute. And are they going to be happy when they have a baby? Are they going to grieve the sleep that they're no longer getting? <laughs> right? Like two weeks into this thing, they can't wait for this baby to arrive. Two weeks later, they'll be going, remember when it was just us? <laughs> and we could do whatever we want. <laughs> Let's read the story. Are you ready? Here's the story. And I'm going to jump to the end after we hear the basic part of it. As Jesus was walking along... He saw a man who had been blind from birth, which means he had never had vision and he has no idea what vision even means, right? He's never seen, so he can have an, uh, a notion, but because he's never done it, he doesn't know what you're, seeing, what you're taking in because he's never taken it in. And his disciples say, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or the sins of his parents? And this is a, like a religious notion that the Jews in that day, it was sort of a modified um, karma thing. That's, that's a Hindu word, but they had this idea that if you had trouble from birth, maybe that was God punishing your kids. And they had, they, they believed you know, that certain blindness was because you had done particular things. And so they're asking for clarity there. And Jesus says, no, it, neither is the short answer. It wasn't his sins or his parents' sin. This happened so that God could, God, the power of God could be seen in him. We must, Jesus goes on, we must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I'm the light of the world. And then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told them, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So, by the way, when, when we go, I'm going to take a group of people at in October to the Holy Land, we're going to visit a couple of sites where they think this pool of Siloam was. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors, this is how insignificant he registered with them. His, his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar ask each other, is that the guy? Uh, who used to, and so they get in an argument about it and it goes on some said he was, others said, no, it just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yeah, I'm the guy. I mean, it's sort of like a comic picture here. And at, he gets then put on trial by the Pharisees, and this is the, this is the climax sentence. When, he, when the blind man who can now see says, I don't know whether he, Jesus, is a sinner or not. But I know this, I was blind and now I can see. It's just one of the iconic stories in scripture. And there are three changes that have to happen in order for, for him to get to, to sight. The first one is that Jesus has to be in the present. Say present. One more time, say present. Like here, here. And we're not good at here. Our bodies go places, but our minds often don't come with us. That's why, you know, it takes about two songs for you to even get into this whole experience, right? Because you're sort of like, it's cold, and where's my glasses, and I should have had breakfast, and I can't believe, you know, and gotta, I got to put a little air in that tire on the way home. You know what I'm talking about? In, in John chapter 8... Jesus does a miracle and 
some of the people don't like it and they're about to kill him. This is the story right before this story. And it says Jesus has to go into hiding while their tempers cool. And then it says Jesus slips out of the temple and then not, chapter 9 verse 1 starts. And while he was walking, he came upon this blind man who'd been blind since birth. There is no miracle if Jesus is still thinking about the assassination attempt that happened a half an hour ago. I want you to think about that. That Jesus, if he was me, because anybody here ever get betrayed? Or laid off? Or you're sick? Or somebody said something hurtful? Or there was a rumor that stung you? And it stays with you? And you go through a divorce? And your girlfriend say, come on, let's go to the ocean and let's ha be together. And, and so your body gets in the car and your body goes to the ocean. Your body's walking on the beach with your girlfriends, but your mind is still back in the court. Right? And you get up and you go to work and you comb your hair and you put your hair tonic in. You do all of that. And, but, but your mind is still on the knock on the door last week when somebody served you papers? You know what I mean? To be present. Je the miracle doesn't happen if Jesus is so preoccupied with the people that hate him that he misses the people that need him. And so Jesus is able to see the need because he's let go of the problem. That's the God you serve, by the way. In case you... Are you losing me here? Thank goodness I'm still loud. Does this work better? Does this work at all? Well, who cares? Jesus is so good, we don't even need a microphone. But we, we do this thing about not being present all the time. Right? Because we, we have this... We have this part of us that we say, oh, God, God wouldn't do a miracle for me because I used to be an addict. So, like, not only are you in the past, but you put God in the past. You think he's back here trying to adjudicate whether or not he, you're a sinner. Newsflash, God's not trying to figure out if you're a sinner. He already knows it, right? Guilty. So why would Jesus need to go back into your past? If you know you're a sinner, he already knows you're a sinner. Now we're just moving on to can we receive forgiveness? God's not in your past. He's in your present. He's in the moment. Here's the second thing. Are you ready? They have to change their preconceived notions. So what preconceived notions were that? The fact that this guy was unworthy because what's, what's happening here? Jesus sees him, and Jesus sees a blind guy. But what do the disciples see? A sinner. And we know they see a sinner because when they see him, they say, who messed up here, Jesus? Did he mess up? Or did his parents mess up? But implied in the question is what? Right. Is he worthy? Well, or really, it's already implied that he's not worthy. Because if he was worthy, this wouldn't have happened. And this still, this, this lie makes its way through churches all over this town. I, I hired this one guy one time, and he was an, a, a, a beautiful man, a kind man. But he had this uh, a religious notion that everybody who uh, got sick, it was an expression of sin in their life. And I, there was another young lady who was um, on the staff who had migraine headaches. And she came to me crying one day and it's like, I, just, I, I don't know what's, I can't think of what sin is in my life and why I keep having these migraine headaches. <laughs> He's my, I'm, I'm sorry for laughing because I know it's a serious, I know it's serious. But she was just beside herself. And I said, who told you that your migraines were sin? And she said, this pastor and this other guy, 
were praying and they told me they knew it was sin because you don't have migraines if you're not a sinner. And both of them, by the way, wore glasses. So I said, well, let me, let me handle it. So I went to go see these guys and I just said to them, hey, I want to ask what sins in your life because your, um, your, your sight is less than what it should be and I'm assuming it's sin. And they were like, what? It felt good. It didn't change them, but I felt better. Because when we, we like to diagnose other people's stuff as sin, but our stuff is natural, right? My, my male pattern baldness is not about sin, <laughs> right? The disciples had to let go. Jesus, what does Jesus say? Pay attention to what Jesus says. Jesus says, none of it, none of it. This is happening so that God can get glory, which me, and then he says, it's almost dark. It's like, it's like saying, knock it off. Do you understand how little time we have left? God's going to get glory through this. A miracle's about to happen. Stop debating whether or not people are worried or uh, whether or not people are uh, sinners. Don't worry about that stuff. It's like coming on a car accident and the car is turned over and the body is spilled out out of the wreckage and the car is steaming and gas is dripping out and uh, it could explode any moment and you run up to the car and you come up to the body and you start sniffing the body to see if he was drinking before he flipped the car. Drag the body away from the car. Your job is rescue, not diagnosis. God wants to do miracles in people's lives, and you're trying to figure out if they're worried, if they're sinners. It's, the, it's asinine. They're sinners. They're all sinners. Are we not, have not all of us sinned and fall short of the glory of God? God wants to do miracles through, exclusively through sinners. I know it's a fact. He only does miracles through sinners. Only. Because that's all he's got to work with. So get over it. God is not in your past. He's in your present. And in your present, he's looking past your worthiness. And he's operating out of his worthiness. Because you are unworthy in and of yourself. That's why we're so excited to be with Jesus. Right? <laughs> my, my wife went to go see Elton John last night. He, he had, it was the last concert in um, Dodger Stadium. Any Elton John fans? Yeah. He's famous for the song, Hold Me Closer, Tony Danza. It's a tribute to Melody. <laughs> Not really. I'll, I'll tell you later. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I don't know Elton John. So if I went to the concert, I would have zero access. If you knew him, you could have access. But I know the King of Kings, and I have complete access, backstage access to him. Because it's miracles are a relational proposition. Here's the third thing. I'm running out of time. You have to change how you view the preparation. Jesus says, uh, it's almost dark. We got to do a miracle, as many miracles as we can. And I'm here to be the light of the world. I'm just here to shine. And I'm going to shine through this blind guy. And I'm going to shine through that guy. And then he starts making mud pies. And can you imagine... The humiliation this guy has lived with all these years. And then somebody starts putting spitballs on his eyes. At some point, would you, would, you, would you blame the blind man if he said, stop. Stop, you're making fun of me. Stop. I don't need to be humiliated anymore. Just give me some money. Well, why would he do that? 
because he doesn't even know what Jesus is preparing him for because he's never seen before. He's about to get vision. And Jesus is putting him through a particular process. It's not the process he did for the last guy. And it's not the same process that he's going to do for the next guy. And what, what happens to us is we get on, we wish we could control God's process for getting us ready to a miracle. So we just like, he starts making spit mud pies and we kind of go, no, 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 I don't want to do that. It's not really spit mud pies. For you, it might be unemployment. For you, it might be struggling with something going on in your body. For you, it might be trusting him with your finances or trusting him through the loneliness of being single. Are you following me? So we just got to, we got to say, God, you're in my present, not critiquing my past. You're going to do a miracle in me, even though I'm not perfect human being. I'm going to reject all of the judgments of others, and I'm going to do what you ask me to do. When you start doing something that makes me uncomfortable, I'm going to say out loud, I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. I trust you. Sometimes I say this 10 times a day. Someone asked me the other day, what's the prayer that I pray the most? Well, right now, the prayer I pray the most is that prayer. I trust you, Jesus. The poet Anne Lamont said once, there's only three prayers. There's just variations of these prayers. Number one is, help me. Number two is, fill me. Number three is, forgive me. And every prayer you've ever prayed probably falls in one of those three categories. God, help us. Let's just do it right now. Would you stand with me? In just a second, every head bowed and every eye closed. In just a second, I'm going to have you, give you the opportunity to come up and pray with somebody. But here's the deal. You're going to have to trust him to see the miracle. You're going to have to change to see the miracle. Some of you, there are people you're not even praying for because you don't think they get it. You don't think they're worthy. You don't think they understand. Why not pray for them even if they don't understand? Maybe the miracle's what's going to help them understand. Did the blind guy understand Jesus? He got to this place where at the end he just said, I don't even know if, he's a, if Jesus is a sinner or not. <laughs> this guy didn't even know he didn't know what category to put Jesus in but he, know, he said this I know that before I couldn't see a thing and now I take in everything so I'm going with him with every head bowed and every eye closed are you, re are you just you're in the middle of change and I'm going to ask today just by a show of hands if you're here today and you're willing to go through the change to get the miracle and you know you need a miracle. When I count to three, you just hold up your hand for seven seconds. Just hold it up, and then after seven seconds, you can put it down. It's just your way of saying, hey, I'm willing to be uncomfortable. I'm willing to set aside judgments. I'm willing to set aside what I think I know about God. And I'm willing to believe that Jesus can still do a miracle. Ready? One, two, three. You just hold that hand up. Even if you're watching online, Hold your hand up where you're sitting. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Come on, let's pray. God, for every person here, whatever that hand represented, do something awesome. Jesus, you're here. And because you're here, this is the best hour of our week. We need miracles, and we know that we get in the way. So this Thanksgiving week, would you help us to see ways that we can just embrace change. And sometimes that change is going to be grieved. We miss our old friends, but we like the miracle we've got. We're, we, we miss our old habits sometimes, but we, we want the miracle anyway. We, we, we understand we didn't quite understand everything about Jesus, but we, we, got our blind, we went from blind to sight. And so we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, don't go out 
if you need a prayer without coming forward and praying with one of these friends, and you just walk up and say, hey, Nelson, hey, Kyle, uh, will you pray with me? And here's the change, okay? They're, they're all humans just like you're humans. So we agree together. There's power in agreement where we say, this is no longer holding me, okay? I look forward to seeing you Wednesday night at 7 for our Thanksgiving service. And until then, I'll see you. Blessings. Make it a great day. Thanks for coming. Come and pray with one of these friends. Thank you for watching tonight. I appreciate everyone that tuned in. I hope you got something from Pastor Dean's word. I just want to encourage you with Thanksgiving coming up in the Christmas season. If you feel inclined to give, do so. You and what you do through your giving blesses so many people. So thank you for being a part of our church. We love you.